it's okay with you, I really want to be respectful of your time. We are asking for a large chunk of it, and I know that you guys are extremely busy right now. So, um, so I want to say good morning, good afternoon to our friends in the north, um, and uh, and I just want to thank you all for being here today. I'm so glad that you're able to join us for this lunch and learn. Um, uh, to talk about this really important initiative and the important work that's going around the domestic violence high-risk team. And um, I'm thrilled that we're able to have our partners, our technical assistance partners, the Jeannie Geiger Crisis Center with us to talk you through and let you know a little bit about the amazing work that they've been doing around this. Um, for all of you, my name is Alicia Nezzi, and um, I actually work for Harris County Domestic Violence Coordinating Council. And the council is a local nonprofit um, and um, when we, we work uh, to develop collaborations um, that will maximize community resources, that will enhance safety to our survivors of domestic violence, and then also hold offenders um, or people who choose to use violence accountable for their actions. So um, we have many different programs that we do, and the Domestic Violence High Risk Team is just one of those programs. And I have the honor and the privilege of being able to lead um, uh, that team, the domestic violence high risk team that's here in Harris County. Um, so uh, before we begin though, and because we have kind of a small group, I was hopeful that we could kind of go around very quickly. And if you could just say the, your name and the agency you represent, um, that would be fantastic. And then we'll kind of dive into how uh, this this time together will we'll, um, we'll go. So I know it's almost like every time I do this, it's Hollywood Squares for me. Um, and so um, so I'm just going to say, Heather, would you, would you be open to kicking it off for everyone and introducing yourself? Sure. Um, so hi, hi everyone. My name is Heather Davies and I'm a project specialist at the Jeannie Geiger Crisis Center. The Jeannie Geiger Crisis Center is located in uh, Northeast Massachusetts, about 40 minutes north of Boston. And we are a domestic violence agency. So we serve clients in our, in our area, but we also receive funding from the Office on Violence Against Women to provide training and technical assistance to communities around the country on the domestic violence hires team model, which we're gonna talk about today. Um, and that is the bulk of my work. I work with communities across the country on implementing the model and also implementing the danger assessment for law enforcement or the DALE. Um, Kelly, do you wanna to add to that? Sure, um, maybe we could just move to slide three real quick. So we, um, so I'm Kelly Dunn, really happy to be with you um, all today. We uh, work with a lot of communities across the nation in our national training and technical assistance project, but I have to say we have a soft spot in our heart for Harris County and Alicia and the work she's been doing. So we're really glad to, to meet some more of you all today doing work in the county. So um, under the Jeannie Geiger Crisis Center and mostly funded through the Department of Justice, we run the Domestic Violence Homicide Reduction National Training and Technical Assistance Center. And our focus is in two areas, the high risk team model and a risk assessment tool that we created with some of the leading researchers in the field of intimate partner violence. Um, called the Danger Assessment for Law Enforcement. So we'll talk to you a little bit more about those. And the last person on our team, I'll throw it to, is Lindsay to introduce her real quick. Hey everyone, my name is Lindsay Smagula. I provide programmatic support for our National Training and Technical Assistance Team. If you have any technical issues today, feel free to chat me directly. Um, and also I'll be monitoring the chat throughout. So much, Lindsay. Veronica, can you introduce yourself real quick? Oh, there we go. <laughs> so I'm Veronica, I'm representing the Justice Administration Department. I was recently hired with them. I started last week on Monday. So this is the end of my second full week. <laughs> so it seems like I've been with them a lot longer at this point. Um, I'm new to Texas, coming from Virginia. And I was hired um, as the survivor of crime specialist and researcher to look at more how the criminal justice system can better serve survivors of crime. So that's going to be kind of my focus with uh, going forward with JAD. Thank you so much. Barbie? Hi, good morning. Barbie Brashear. I'm with the Domestic Violence Coordinating Council. It's good to see you all here today. Naomi? I'm Naomi Walker with JAD. Um, I do kind of a little bit of everything, so. <laughs> Fantastic, thanks for being here. Um, Suzanne? 
Hi, I'm Suzanne. Uh, I am actually a consultant working with JAD uh, and on sort of their uh, victim services assessment in Harris County. So greetings from a uh, very, very, very cold, rainy Portland, Oregon right now. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Stephanie? Hi, I'm Stephanie Armour, and I'm Program Special Projects Administrator with JAD, and I just want to thank you for including us on this important um, luncheon today. We're really happy to be here. Thank you. Great. Laura? Hi, I am the Communications and Media Relations Rep for JAD, and I will second what Stephanie says. Thank you for having us. Glad to be here. Great. Thank you. Jim? Yes, Alicia, thank you. Um, Heather, Kelly, Lindsay, um, really looking forward to the presentation and I'm really glad a good number of our team has joined us. And, and I'm delighted that Barbie, Amy and Alicia had kind of reached out to us and saying, hey, let's, let's kind of have a, a monthly check-in, which I think has been exceedingly helpful. And so this, this project, um, I really appreciate y'all, um, your support on this. And look forward to um, learning and then however we can support, we will do so. That's great. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, Mary? Hey, everybody. Good morning. I'm Mary McFadden with the Harris County District Attorney's Office. I'm the division chief over our Family Criminal Law Division, which, of course, is our Family Violence Unit, our Protective Order Unit, Animal Cruelty Unit, uh, Elder Abuse Unit, and something else I've forgotten, Family Violence Social Service or Family Violence Services Unit as well. I know there's five. I I got to four easily. Um, thank you to the council for inviting me on this call. Of course, I did the training with Jeannie Geiger when they were in Pasadena, um, but it's always good to have it fresh in my mind. And then I'm here to answer any questions if there are any from, um, from the group as it relates to what we're doing at the DA's office with the judges and those type of things. So good morning. Thank you, Mary. Amy, last but not least. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Amy Smith. I'm with the Domestic Violence Coordinating Council, and I am coming from, to you from the very cold office of my office because it's freezing in here, so I can relate to the Portland folks. Uh, but it's hot outside. So welcome, everybody, and uh, um, back to you, Alicia. Thank you so much. Well, um, today's presentation will be broken down kind of in two parts. So I want to say that um, first you'll hear from the Jeannie Geiger Crisis uh, Center team. They're going to give you some really great information about how this concept um, came together, this idea came together of the domestic violence high-risk team. Um, they're going to provide lots of good information on statistics and research. They're also going to share some of the reasons why they're nationally recognized for this model. Um, there are, and, and also dive into some work that they're doing in other communities. So they're going to take the majority of the presentation and then uh, towards the end I'm going to talk a little bit about how this project came to Texas but more importantly Harris County and what we're doing right now and how we're partnering with the Jeannie Geiger Crisis Center um, to, to continue to revise and do better. So, um, so we have built in time for questions but as Lindsay had shared with you if you want to use the chat we'll be monitoring that um, uh, you know if anything comes to mind in the meantime. Okay, so um, I think without further ado, let's go ahead and get started, Heather. So I, this is Kelly, so I'm actually gonna start Alicia and then I'll, I'll throw it over to Heather in just a few minutes. So our, um, so as we discussed, we run a, the Domestic Violence Homicide Reduction National Training and Technical Assistance Center and under that is funded by the Department of Justice. Um, so we are um, happy to have them as partners. We always start with this slide. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And really just to set the foundation for our comments. You know, we've done this work in lots of communities. Um, our latest implementation being a pretty big implementation in the city of Cleveland. And what we've learned is you can't skip the process that without the good policy and the training and really getting everyone on the same page, what we're trying to do is fairly complicated to reduce the rate of intimate partner homicide in the county. Um, it requires really everyone being very clear about what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're using this information to our, inform our decision-making. And it just simply takes time to, to get every, everybody rowing in the same direction and focused. But, um, it really is time well spent. I've realized you can do these implementations fast or you can do them well, but you can't do, do, you can't do them both. You can't do them fast and well. Um, and so that's part of what we're doing today is just to kind of get, get everybody grounded in this model. Um, what is its foundation and what are we trying to do here? So with that said, 
We're going to talk to you a little bit about the model, um, and we're happy to answer questions. We're going to talk to you about what we know about intimate partner homicide. We are big believers in data and research, and we are constantly using the research you all have created in your communities about what you know about intimate partner homicide in your county, what we know nationally about intimate par partner homicide, and making sure our approaches are really grounded in that research. So we'll talk to you a little bit, little bit about that. We will introduce you to our danger assessment for law enforcement that is up and running in Pasadena. Um, it is our risk assessment tool. Uh, it's been uh, in creation for about five years and was created in partnership with Dr. Jacqueline Campbell, who's one of the leading researchers in intimate partner homicide. And then we'll move on to send it over to Alicia for some conversation about what's happening locally. <clears throat> Go to the next slide, Linz. So like so many um, innovations in our field, the catalyst is often a tragedy, which was the case for us. Um, the homicide of a client of ours in 2002 was really the inspiration for this model. And we had many victims killed in Massachusetts that year, but this particular case received a lot of local and national attention. I think there were like 30, 20 or 30 articles in the, in the Boston Globe and um, the case made the national news. And, why the case was pulled from the so many that were killed was because he was before the court in four days before he killed her. So he um, was before the court released on 500 cash, uh, broke, broke into her house and killed her while her young child was on the phone with dispatch and almost killed an officer that night. One of our officers was almost killed that night as well. And so what that case taught us was that we really had uh, no, and I, and I will say that the easy analysis was, well, it's the judge's fault, right? He was before the court four days before, and I think that was the easy analysis and certainly the analysis that the paper took. It was not the analysis of those of us that were working the case. We knew it was a much more nuanced set of circumstances that, uh, that opened up this gap for this homicide to occur. Um, this offender was before the court with no criminal record to speak of for a single violation of an order of protection. The 500 cash bail was a reasonable decision based on the information before the court. The problem was we all had small pieces of information and no one had all of the information. And that's sort of the power of risk assessment. It can bring forward that information. So we identified that we had no mechanism to identify the most dangerous cases. We had no way to pull forward the most dangerous cases from our caseload. Even if we did, we had no agreed upon formal process for communicating and tracking those cases once they sort of entered our system. And those of you that have worked cases that end in homicide know you have one decision, you have one moment to make a decision. And we all want the best possible information in front of us when we, make, when we have to make those difficult decisions in the high risk cases. And that's what we're trying to do is get the best information in front of the decision makers when you have to make the decision. Because it doesn't matter 10 minutes after the decision is made. Um, and we had this assumption that the, most the victims at most risk for homicide would go into shelter. And that just simply is not true. Um, and it's no more evident than right now with, with this pandemic and um, victim, you know, survivors not wanting to go into shelters and also all of our shelters being full. And so this was a dangerous assumption if we thought, boy, you know, if victims are at that high risk, those are the victims that will, will enter shelter. And we had to question that assumption. So the model has four components. So we use risk assessment, which is evidence-based risk assessment to identify which cases have the highest potential to escalate to lethal levels. Those cases then go on to a multidisciplinary team. We truly believe you cannot prevent homicide alone. It is only in the working together and the sharing of information that the homicides are prevented. Unfortunately, we can't simply prosecute our way out of these cases as well. We must consider prosecution alongside of victim services, not knowing that not every case is gonna be prosecuted. Um, so making sure that we're connecting high-risk victims to services and then ongoing monitoring and management of these cases as they go through the system. So these are the four components. We use gears to represent them because they are not standalone solutions. They only work when they're connected. <clears throat> So in a very practical way, it works like this. We use the danger assess assessment, which is an 11 question form to help identify which cases are most dangerous. That will screen about 30% of cases into that high danger category. Those 30% of cases 
will go on, um, we'll connect those high risk victims to services. As soon as we identify them as high risk, they'll be connected in a very fast fashion to services. We also will use that risk assessment to inform the court immediately that it's a high risk case to use in bail and bond determination and conditions of release. And then those cases move on to the high risk team. And the high risk team is really the risk management part of this team. So they will do things like respond to witness intimidation, respond to violations of probation, right? In a timely way and do the risk management. So the goal is to, uh, to reduce domestic violence homicide of the cases that come on to the team and domestic violence homicide in the community, but also to do this audit of the system, right? We were just doing a presentation in Louisville and, and one of the women described this as, you know, we keep pulling bodies out of the river, but we're not going down the river to see, you know, what's happening. And we refuse to do that in the high, in the DVHRT world. Um, we are really about, if we identify a gap in the system, it is our responsibility to close that gap so the next person does not fall into it. And we consider ourselves to be very diagnostic about what's wrong with the system. So just saying it's broken is not helpful, but what particular part of the system is broken and how can we use this team to sort of garner the political will to close that part of the system? So the audit happens in real time. If you think of this like a fatality review where after the homicide, everyone comes back to the table and tries to figure out where the opportunities to intervene were, we're doing this in real time. We're identifying the cases that have the potential to escalate and we are making sure we are sort of shepherding those cases as they go through the system to prevent that escalation. So the principles that support the model is early identification of high-risk cases. So you wanna get them as early into the process um, as possible. Communication and coordination across disciplines. So unlike maybe a coordinated community response where you're talking about policy, we are discussing particular cases and doing case management across systems. And then looking at each victim's specific life circumstances and trying to tailor our um, risk management strategies to that particular victim. We have high risk teams in 21 states, not the whole state, but um, in 21 different states. And we have the danger assessment for law enforcement. Our risk assessment tool is being used in 26 police departments across the country. We um, are part currently under a National Institute of Justice is studying the model, Department of Justice um, uh, termed the model a, a leading promising practice in homicide reduction, and they funded a study in Cleveland. And so as part of the study, we've implemented in two of the five police precincts across the city. So some early data from that has uh, showed us that we were averaging 2.61 intimate partner homicides per year just in those precincts. We instituted the Dale in December of 2016, and we saw a 62% reduction um, in the intimate partner homicides average reduction in those police precincts. So we're seeing some pretty good data out of Cleveland and there will be a National Institute of Justice uh, research study released hopefully soon. We've been saying that for a while. We're really anxious to get that, but that is underway and we'll be happy to share it with you all when it comes out. So I think Heather's gonna talk a little bit about um, intimate partner homicide trends and what we know about these homicides. Yeah, so thanks. Kelly set the stage for, for how our community was impacted by a domestic violence homicide and then some of the steps that we took to close those gaps. So I just want to provide a little bit of context about just how prevalent a problem intimate partner homicide is, both nationally and in Texas, by looking at some of these trends. So the domestic violence uh, hires team model is a homicide reduction model. And when people ask us, why do we focus on the homicides? This is why. There are a significant number of intimate partner homicides nationally. Nearly half of all female homicide victims in the US are killed by a current or former male intimate partner. Um, and nearly three women are killed in the US every day by a current or former intimate partner. And what we've seen is that for a while there was a downward trend in homicides that the homicides seem to be decreasing, but between there was a, a recent study um, that showed that there was an increase by nearly 20% between the years 2014 and 2017 in the US. So we're on an upward trend right now in DV homicides. <clears throat> So 
So according to the Texas Council on Family Violence, which carefully tracks this data, 150 women were killed by their male intimate partners in Texas in 2019. Um, and I should also note that 31 men were killed by their female intimate partners and one woman and three men were killed by same sex intimate partners. Um, and it's not just the primary or the intended victims that die in these events. Also, according to TCFB, um, 20, uh, there were 20 related victims who were killed and six related victims who were injured in the commission of these intimate partner homicides. So it, it impacts whole communities. <clears throat> Um, so Texas ranked um, 13th when we look at how, how Texas compares to the rest, uh, the rest of the country. Texas ranks 13th in the United States for women who were killed by men in single victim, single offender homicides. <clears throat> so this graph shows the number of women who were killed by their intimate partner, by their intimate partners in Harris County specifically. And as you can see, the numbers were, were steadily climbing between 2014 and 2017, and then they spiked in 2018 with 42 women who were killed. Um, this year, uh, and then they went back down a little bit in, in 2019. This year, 2020, is a little bit different uh, because of the pandemic. During the shutdown, many victims were stuck at home with their abusers in close quarters. Resources were more difficult to access. Unemployment skyrocketed, and we know that an abuser who's unemployed, um, that is a risk factor for intimate partner homicide. Um, so, and, and while a national pandemic like this is unprecedented, at least in recent history, there may be some correlation to a pandemic and natural disasters, uh, which are often correlated with an increase in intimate partner violence and intimate partner homicide. And in fact, there was an increase in intimate partner violence levels after Hurricane Harvey in 2017. Um, so right now, as at this point in the year, we know that 26 charges have been filed in Harris County relating to intimate partner homicide. So it looks like we are on track to surpass the 2019 numbers. <clears throat> so we know that there's a strong link between DV homicides and suicide. Nationally, there's nearly a third of all domestic violence homicides are homicide suicides where the perpetrator kills the victim and then kills themselves. And in 2019, 29% of men killed themselves after killing their female intimate partners in Texas. So very close to that, to that national numbers, to that national number. So we know that DV suspects who are suicidal often pose a higher risk um, to the victim. And there's actually a question about suicidality on the Dale, which is uh, the risk assessment tool that we use in our model. So we also know that there is a disparate impact uh, of intimate partner homicide on different racial groups, particularly the African American community, and that is well documented. So we know that women of color are at particularly high risk for homicide, including intimate partner homicides. And you know, Harris County is is twenty percent uh, African American or Black, and forty three percent Hispanic. Uh, or Latino. <clears throat> so studies have found that Black women uh, were murdered by men at a rate more than two and a half times higher than white women. And in one particular study, 61% of all homicides of Hispanic women were intimate partner violence related, uh, which was a higher proportion than any other ethnic group in that particular study. And also that 39% of Native American women identified as, intimate, as victims of intimate partner violence, which is a rate higher than any other race or ethnicity. So also just want to note that, um, that immigrant and refugee women face multiple barriers, which put them at high risk for intimate partner violence and intimate partner homicide. And a, a recent study of intimate partner uh, homicide during the time period between 2003 and 2013 um, determined that foreign born victims were more likely than US born victims to be associated with intimate partner violence related deaths. Um, and I also just wanna note that, you know, 26%, um, a little over a quarter of folks in Harris County are foreign born. <clears throat> So now that we've talked about some of these statistics, we're going to transition to the research that focuses on how to identify cases that might escalate to a lethal or near lethal assault. So the next several slides, we're going to expand on what we know about cases that escalate to a lethal level.
So in most domestic violence cases that end in homicide, there are identifiable patterns leading up to the homicide. And in fact, the research tells us that the escalation of domestic violence to a lethal level follows identifiable patterns with identifiable indicators. So when we can identify early in the process which cases are escalating towards a homicide, then there are opportunities for the system to intervene in those cases. And that's really what the model does. It identifies the most dangerous cases early and puts in place immediate and long-term risk management strategies to intervene in those cases. So studies suggest that many victims who are ultimately killed have some contact with the system in the year prior to their murder. And these studies based uh, very Based on, based on the location of, of where the studies take place um, and who the contact was with, but this does seem to be a pattern. Um, there's in one particular study, the majority of victims or perpetrators or both, up to 83%, had contact with criminal justice, victims assistance, and or healthcare agencies in the year prior to the homicide. And in the year prior to the homicide, more than 44% of abusers were arrested and almost a third of victims contacted the police. So these cases are known to us. They're, they're in our system up to a year prior to the homicide. And the use of risk assessment will help us to identify these cases and respond differently. So research also suggests that a, a victim who uses domestic violence services is less likely to be killed. Um, only 4% of abused victims had used a domestic violence hotline or shelter within the year prior to being killed by a partner. So this program, as Kelly mentioned, really seeks to increase the likelihood that a victim will access domestic violence services through, um, uh, through that, uh, this on-scene protocol that off law enforcement um, are using when they use the DALE. This is really key. We're really trying to drive victims back to domestic violence services and not necessarily to shelter um, because, because anecdotally, we know that services can be protective against domestic violence homicides. And I just wanted to, to note in one particular study, uh, Lindsay, if you wanna advance the slide, um, there's, a, there's a 2019 study in, that was specifically uh, conducted in Houston that showed that police, um, showing that police had been in contact with the victim for a domestic violence complaint in 91% of cases three years prior to the homicide. So this was, this was homicide cases that in 91% of those cases there had been police contact. Um, so we know that at, at a minimum, um, law enforcement is coming in contact with these cases. So again, if we can put these immediate risk management strategies and implement risk assessment on scene, that can have a real impact in identifying these cases. We also know that victims are at the highest risk of homicide by a partner when leaving the relationship. So the most dangerous time is within the first year of leaving and more precisely within the first three months. Um, the, the risk of homicide does tend to diminish with the length of separation. So if the victim can get away and, and stay away for a year or more, then their risk does go down. But this whole piece about um, being more at risk after leaving is really counterintuitive to, to most people who don't uh, work in, in this field. So you know, we know when these homicides are likely to occur. There's this three-month danger window. And that often corresponds with the pretrial period when an offender is out on bail and when there's a separation due to a recent assault. We see a lot of homicides happening during this window and when there's still a case pending before the court. So this model really is intended to focus in on that danger window, that pretrial period through the use of, of risk assessment to inform decision-making in court, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. And specifically in Texas, I noted that 35% um, of women who were killed in 2019 in Texas had either ended or were in the process of ending their relationship. So more than a third of, um, of homicide, intimate partner homicide victims. <clears throat> so we know also that when a gun is present in a house with domestic violence, a homicide is five times more likely to occur. Um, and 63% of women killed by male intimate partners in Texas in 2019 were killed by a firearm. So we know that gun ownership is a significant risk factor for lethality. And it's something that, it's a question that's on the danger assessment for law enforcement. Um, so law enforcement, you know, asking, in, in addition to finding out from, from the victim whether uh, the, the offender owns a gun, asking about the presence of guns, documenting the number of weapons, legally seizing uh, any un, unauthorized weapons can be a life-saving measure in homes where there's domestic violence. <clears throat> 
So we're going to talk to you a little bit about um, the risk, ass risk assessment for law enforcement or the, the DALE, but we want to pull back before we take a look at the DALE and talk generally about risk assessment. So this is really the question that risk assessment um, asks us to entertain. Can we predict domestic violence homicides? And I would argue, you know, we don't have perfect prediction here. That's not what we have, but we have some really good instruments and we know the 19 red flags for domestic violence homicide. And when those are present, it does, the research is strong enough to indicate these are the cases that we need to draw our attention to. So risk assessment's a term you hear a lot, uh, both in the domestic violence field and in other fields. And we just wanted to pause and be really clear about what we're talking about. So risk of what and risk to whom. So you can think about risk assessment kind of as an umbrella term. Um, and a lethality assessment is a specific kind of risk assessment tool that predicts the risk of lethal or near lethal violence. Right? And so some risk assessment tools predict the risk of recidivism. Some risk assessment tools predict the risk of likelihood to return to court. Um, some risk assessment tools uh, predict the risk of reassault. But here we are particularly talking about the risk of lethal and near lethal violence when we're talking about risk assessment. So choosing a tool is really a key. Once a community chooses a tool, they really make an important decision and it locks in a lot of decisions to come about what they're able to do with that tool. Um, we would argue that communities should only be using research-based risk assessment tools. We really worry about this trend of communities wanting to select a few questions from this tool that measures reassault, this tool that measures recidivism, select some lethality questions, and then let's just slap on a few more kind of extra questions because we like these questions too. What you, the trade-off for that is that you really divorce the tool at that point from its predictive validity and from its research base. And particularly if you plan to use that, that tool in court, you've now really changed the tool and it does not have a research foundation to really point to. So we would caution you from, from that sort of approach to risk assessment. Uh, predictive validity is an important term to understand in risk assessment it is simply how well this thing predicts what it says it's going to predict, right? The correct prediction of future events. It's the most important measure of accuracy for a risk assessment instrument. How many false negatives and false positives is this tool going to give you? It's a term we're all really familiar with now, unfortunately, with COVID testing, this idea of how well, how good is the test, how, how many false positives and false negatives do we have, how accurate is it? And so risk assessment tools that are based in research have an established predictive validity. So risk assessment really, um, the main function of risk assessment, at least as the original risk assessment created by Dr. Jacqueline Campbell in the 80s, was really to help victims raise their own awareness of the level of risk they were in because victims tend to take protective actions if we help them understand their risk. And so they also have application in the criminal justice field, but we don't wanna ever lose this main core function of risk assessment, um, and which is why it's important when we do risk assessment with victims that we're informing them of what the tool is telling us. <clears throat> so risk assessment really, you can think of it like a filter where we take all of our domestic violence cases and then it's going to filter out the most dangerous cases. Depending on what risk assessment you use is gonna tell you how, what percentage of cases it's gonna filter into that high danger category. Um, this is particularly important in a community like Houston where the call volume is very high. So if you select a risk assessment tool that's gonna to filter 60 or 70% of cases into that high danger category, that's going to be quite difficult when you're use, when you're talking about the volume of cases Houston is dealing with. Risk assessment also provides this language, this common language across systems to talk about cases, right? The conversation can change when we're using a, a common language and a shorthand about these cases. And risk assessment really acts as an, acts as an anchor for decision making in the criminal justice or in the court context. Again, we don't think it should be the driver of information. We don't think we don't necessarily want a situation where a score of this equals this kind of bail or this kind of bond. 
we want it to be an anchor to help us make better decisions around conditions of release, GPS monitoring, bail and bond. So it's an important addition or an, a way to anchor our decision making. It's always important before you introduce a risk assessment tool into the community that you've answered this question. Why are we gathering this information and what are we going to do with it? We would argue that you can do more harm with risk assessment unless you've truly considered this question. We don't wanna gather a lot of really um, personal information from survivors and then not understand clearly how that information is gonna travel from each decision maker and how it's gonna impact their decision making. So this is part of the implementation of the domestic violence high risk team model is really making sure we've taken time to answer this question across our systems. So we're gonna int introduce you to uh, the danger assessment for law enforcement. It is a derivative of the danger assessment. The danger assessment is a tool that's been around since the eighties created out of Johns Hopkins with this wonderful woman, Dr. Jacqueline Campbell, who we are um, lucky enough to call a, a colleague and a partner of ours, and she created the danger assessment for law enforcement with us. So let's take a look at it. Hopefully you can see it a little bit better there. So it is 11 questions. Um, so there are 19 red flags for lethality. This question is a shorter form of that. We've selected 11 questions. Um, and here's how it works. You'll see at the top, the victim can decline the screen. So this is instituted by law enforcement. So after a law enforcement call for service, they would ask these victims these 11 questions. The victim does, has the, does have the right to decline the screen if she, she or he wants. Um, there is a yes, no, and a not answered option. Victims can also choose to answer some questions and not others. You'll notice here there is also some information, a little space to write a narrative. So what we've learned over the years, particularly from our prosecutors, is that's great that we have that information that he threatened to kill her, but can, you, can we get a little information about what specifically was the threat, right? So the prosecutor said, we can make better use of this if you can just give us a little bit more specific information, more than the yes or no. And that's why we've left that narrative under there. We don't always get information, but when we get it, it tends to be really important information. The risk assessment is scored and there is a cutoff score of seven. So seven or more affirmative answers would put the case in the high risk category. However, the cutoff is a guide. There is no perfect cutoff. Um, we use seven as a guide, but uh, seven or more would put the case in the high risk category. There is another option for the officers to override a low score. So an example of this, this risk assessment ended up with a score of four. The officer hit the further re review, meaning that the officer believed this case was high risk. Officers must justify why they believe the case is high risk on the form. Again, this is from listening to our prosecutors. We can't have officers tell us they wanna override the low score without telling us why. They must articulate why. And so you'll see here the officer said, victim seemed really scared with physical harm due to her teeth being knocked out in a previous assault. She truly believes he will kill her. Um, this is the kind of information we want from officers and officers across the board have done really, really well with the override. Um, so what we don't want to see here is like previous DV, right? That's not going to help us. We want this level of detail in the justification. So just a, just a few closing notes about the Dale and risk assessment in general. Um, one thing that the Dale does not do is it doesn't ask about what happened that particular night that law enforcement are responding to the scene. Uh, the questions on the Dale are historic in nature. They're asking, have these things ever happened in your relationship? Because it's through that history and context that we can predict risk. If we only have a snapshot of what's going on in that relationship, it's not going to capture whether that case may be escalating towards a homicide. So that's why the questions are, are phrased in that way, because nothing is nothing happens in a vacuum. We want to know what has been happening in that in the during the course of that relationship up until that point to be able to tell if that victim is high risk. <clears throat> So the ideas here are identification and prevention. So again, just sort of bringing, bringing back those, those core uh, ideas from, from how this model was created, early identification of the most dangerous cases through risk assessment is key. Um, 
And then the ongoing, it, that makes the Dale an effective way of reducing domestic violence homicide because um, it's that plus the accompanying protocols that go along with the Dale, those risk management strategies that help to prevent the homicides. Um, so we're, when we work with law enforcement, we uh, work with them to develop a customized protocol that officers can follow to connect high-risk victims to domestic violence services from the scene. Again, that's an important goal. And then of course, um, we want to, uh, we know, uh, because we know that domestic violence services are protective. And then to working with them to determine how that information that's gathered on the DAIL will be used to argue for things like um, uh, stricter conditions of release and how it will impact bond and bail. So that's the offender accountability piece. And then of course, there's the long-term risk management strategies, which is where the domestic violence high-risk team comes in. They are then monitoring those high-risk cases throughout the, the, the life of those cases until a reasonable degree of safety has been reached. So Heather, maybe we should just pause here. So, um, so Heather, I'm just, we may okay. pause here and just see if there are any questions up to this point. We'll also pause for questions at the end, but before we get too far in, um, any questions on the model or the Dale? Um, I have a couple questions, if, if that's okay for me to jump in. Um, one is, I know with the original Campbell assessment instrument that that was validated on women, has this Dale been validated on men as well? Good question. So the Dale is used on male victims and uh, female, uh, both. So if it's a male survivor or a female survivor, the Dale, the officers do use the Dale. As far as the research, no, it is based off of the research. The research is based off of female victim, male perpetrator. Very tough to get that research just because the numbers are mm -hmm. fairly low the other way. I'd love to see some better research on that, but mm -hmm. we just don't have that. No, that's fine. Um, and then just my second question, so other people can jump in, um, is uh, I, I was I was interested in the officer override piece. Um, do you guys have any data about like how often officers are overriding scores, like to what extent that's happening, um, you know, and, and any sort of more longitudinal data about whether or not those overrides have um, have like sort of impacted outcomes? Mm -hmm. So officers tend to, so all of our communities that use the Dale give research, give data back to us. And I don't know that we have a slide showing you that, but we have to be happy to send you the kind of research, uh, the kind of data that is sent back to us. So mm -hmm. officers typically override between two and as high as 7% of cases, depending on the jurisdiction. Cleveland has, which is a fairly large jurisdiction, I believe they've been right in the four to 5% um, category of officer override. Okay. Great. We don't have any long um, research on that. I will mm -hmm. tell you that we have had one homicide in Cleveland, and that was a case where it was four of four, and the officer had had done an override on that case. Okay, got it. Thank you. Any other questions? This is Jim. Um, quick question. Um, I'm assuming this is an automated form, so it, it's electronic, or is it paper, or so once the law enforcement officer fills this out, what's the process to get to the district attorney's office? So our requirement is that it has to be to the DA's office prior to first appearance. How you operationally do that um, really just depends on, we don't know enough about how your system works okay. um, exactly to do that, but it certainly can be um, integrated into an electronic system if that's what you all have. Good. And then assuming the court agrees with the prosecution to, to do this monitoring, who would pay for that device? You mean if, if GPS is ordered on a high-risk yes. offender? Yeah, that is also a jurisdictional decision. I don't know, Alicia, do you wanna? Um... Yeah, Jim, that's one of the things that we're, we're researching right now um, based on some of the uh, cases that we're seeing. Um, and this is where we would wanna enter into that partnership. And, um, and we were uh, thinking of using some of the COVID money, COVID relief money that we had received 
to be able to pay for the GPS monitoring for these um, for these offenders. The the app that the survivor could download that would uh, text or make a phone call if a radius, a certain radius, was breached. And then um, we are committed to um, paying for that in install, having that ankle monitor, and up to a year of that monitoring and service for the survivor. Very good. And then I would be curious um, in one of the stats previously, I, I saw that after the first three months, the likelihood um, of intimate partner violence goes down dramatically. I'm assuming there's probably a process um, where if there's not the perceived threat that maybe it wouldn't be for a month or six months, um, that there might be a process, you know, three months you know, kind of do a check-in or something to see whether or not the monitoring still needs to be taking place. Absolutely, we can we can definitely take a look at that. I mean, this um, would be something we would be really um, paying attention to, just because it was kind of seen as a pilot project, um, and we would want to see, um, you know, first of all, if that case actually qualifies, and then yes, to continue to monitor to make sure that um, that it was it was a you know, effective and how do we feel about this? Do we need to continue? Great. Conversation for that. No, thank you. Can I, can I jump in really quick and maybe our colleagues from uh, Jeannie Geiger can help. Um, that three, that three month cool down data, if, if my memory is correct, that's referring to post adjudication. Is that, does it also apply to pre adjudication? So if you guys, if you've got, if you guys, you know, they're out pending trial you know, um, are you still seeing that same cool down after time or is that or is that post adjudication only? Research doesn't necessarily looking at adjudication, it's looking at post separation. So it's sort of starting the clock from when the okay. parties separate. So we're looking at the post separation period um, and the three month hom homicides occur most often in the three months post separation. Got it. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so I, there is one thing I wanna I wanna yeah. add, Heather. I think Alicia, if I'm not wrong, and and Mary, Pasadena is doesn't have this electronically. They're uploading, they're they're scanning and uploading a copy of that. Is that how that's working? Okay, going back to the to the danger assessment for law enforcement. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, Glad you bring that up, Barbie. Um, uh, Mary, um, I believe right now that's, I think that we were looking into automating that, but yes, right now that it is scanned and it goes over, um, attaches to the probable cause, correct? So it, it is scanned into our system. Depending on when it is sent to us, it is picked up at the next business day if it's a weekend, right? And so we have never been able to crack through pretrial to get them to attach it. Our prosecutors who do probable cause have access to it and can certainly look at it once it's uploaded into our system. But we, um, we had several conversations and could just never get the, the electronic system in place or the agreement for them to receive and attach because the judges get their information from pretrial, not the DA's office. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. And can I, I just do a follow up? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that highlights why we wanted to start with a small, like a pilot jurisdiction in Pasadena, right? So that will allow us to, to figure out where are the pain points that we kind of need to figure out and smooth out. So when we, you know, if there's wider um, adoption with Houston PD, we'll have figured out some of that. We'll, ha we'll have an opportunity to figure that out in a smaller community. I just want to go back to the separation issue. Um, how... When, when we talk about separation, because I think there's, uh, we're bordering on a little thing that uh, could be dangerous of a three month, six month, you know, a, an arbitrary kind of timeline for review. When we talk about separation, we're not talking about the, the police, the law enforcement separation, right? We're talking about the victim who states or makes um, um, some type of a step, right? Whether it's to go to that shelter and separate or states, I am leaving you. I mean, there's there's some active, some act by the complainant, right? Not just the police. I just wanna make sure that I'm clear on that so that as we continue to have these conversations about with the GPS monitoring and review, what that should look like. Am, am I misunderstanding that? You are not misunderstanding that. You're absolutely right. So okay. it's the 
post-separation period, what matters here is the offender believes that the victim is trying to leave him, right? In this circumstance, I'm using him and her. Um, that he's, so the, the perpetrator is gonna increase the level of violence to try to get the victim back in control. And that's the dynamic that we often see before the escalation. So it's about the perpetrator believing that the victim is trying to leave the relationship. That's the key. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, I think we have just a few more slides before I'm gonna, gonna turn it over to, um, to Alicia. So we were talking about this whole idea of um, identification and then prevention, which are the, the integration of these risk management strategies. And we, I, we always use this quote by Dr. Jill Messing, who's one of the other leading researchers on femicide in the country and also one of the co-creators of the Dale, um, which is that intimate partner violence risk assessment alone is not what prevents um, the negative outcomes. Rather, it's the interventions with victim survivors and perpetrators that follow an assessment of high risk that have an opportunity to reduce risk and future violence and homicide. So it's, it's not the tools in and of themselves that prevent the negative outcomes. It's what you do with that information. And many jurisdictions who contact us and you know, wanna, wanna use the Dale say, just give us the tool, just give us the tool, we'll, we'll start using it. And we really, we don't do that. Um, it's again, it's the interventions, the risk management strategies that are formed with that information. So we work with law enforcement to implement policy within their uh, departments to make sure that the Dale is being used correctly. There's there's training, there's officer training. Um, you know, it is it is a thoughtful process uh, that goes along with implementation of the Dale because we want to make sure that those those intervention strategies are in place. Uh, in perpetuity, and that they're not things that are just going to sort of go off the radar after a few months. <clears throat> so proper training on risk assessment is absolutely key. Um, all those who are either using it or and administering it or considering it in decision making should be trained. So that includes judges, prosecutors, pretrial services, probation, obviously law enforcement, and advocates as well who are going to be getting uh, this information uh, when there's that connection from the scene that takes place. <clears throat> so just ending here with a note about implementing DVHRTs in high volume jurisdictions. And I think this is a nice segue into um, Alicia's piece talking about what specifically has been happening in Harris County. So when, when implementing DVHRTs, one of the things that we look at from the outset is case volume. So when the volume of high-risk cases that the team accepts and monitors each month is, is too high, it, you know, it, it diminishes the team's ability to effectively impact these cases. Um, and in particularly high volume jurisdictions, um, it's you know, sometimes necessary to think of other solutions and adapt adaptations to the model that, uh, that may need to be incorporated. So some of these solutions might be, you know, having more than one DVHRT. So again, you know, we started in a pilot site with, um, with Pasadena. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes larger, large jurisdictions need to be broken up into smaller teams to effectively handle the case volume, um, either based on, based, on the, based on a city or police district or what, you know, whatever that particular community, um, however it's set up. Or it could involve adding in uh, triage points, additional triage points. So the Dale is filtering out the most dangerous cases and there may need to be another mechanism that's used to lower that number even further. Perhaps a small group of people who are looking and examining these, uh, these cases uh, and all of the attendant circumstances that go along with them. We do, we do feel strongly that whatever those triage points may be, that it's based on risk and not something sort of arbitrary, like whether the victim wants to cooperate with the court case or, or something, something that isn't based on the actual risk of that victim. Um, and it could, or it could also be something like having smaller teams um, that, are, that are sort of managing it in different parts of, of the jurisdiction that are, that are identifying these cases and sort of filtering through them and then sending the absolute most dangerous cases onto a larger team uh, for a more intensive intervention while the others cases that are identified are continue to be monitored by these smaller teams. So, um, you know, as you know, we Harris County has a population of about four and a half million people. 
that's really what we're doing now is, you know, the, the folks who work on the current DVHRT, uh, Alicia and everyone else have done such an amazing job um, with the resources that they had handling an enormous population for this DVHRT. And that is what we're doing right now is we're working um, on doing an assessment of Harris County, how the team currently operates and exploring what the options are um, to, uh, to, to possibly you know, be able to, to, to find other mechanisms to deal with that enormous population. And this is where thinking about you know, the risk assessment tool that whatever tool is decided upon in Harris County is so, so important because again, thinking about how are you going to get down to the most manageable number of cases? And so, you know, the, this, the sort of, you know, we don't want a knee jerk reaction to use a tool that might screen in a much larger, um, you know, volume of cases or a tool that isn't designed to be used in court if you all want to use it in court just to have something in place. It really needs to be an iterative, thoughtful um, process and decision around risk assessment. So, um, so with that, I just want to hand it over to Alicia, who's going to talk more about the specific steps that have been uh, that have been happening in Harris County up to this point. Thank you so much, Heather, um, and thank you, Kelly, for sharing that great background on how you guys were able to put together this amazing um, this amazing concept um, and and team. So, so like Heather said, I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, it was brought here to Texas, how the teams that this concept was brought to Texas, and then what we're doing in Harris County. As you just learned um, from uh, uh, the uh, folks who, you know, um, I often say, you know, um, often imitated, never duplicated, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the originators of this concept, you know, this is a, a really powerful way to be able to look at these cases and to provide the support and safety and the offender accountability on um, um, for cases that deserve our attention. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about um, how the, um, it came to Texas. Um, so, you know, what, what I think it's important to know is that this concept really was born in 2005 and, um, and it received this national attention. Um, many communities tried to, to duplicate this. Um, it, was, it was seen as a very successful initiative. Um, and, and so, you know, the Texas Council on Family Violence, again, our state coalition, um, decided to see if we could get funding to be able to start these types of teams here in Texas. Um, so during the, the 2017 Texas legislative session, they, they did just that. They asked for, for money to be able to see about starting these teams here in Texas. Um, that ask was, was um, actually granted. It was a successful ask. And so they were able to roll out some of these teams um, fairly early on. Um, they did look at um, a couple of different counties um, through that first round. It was Dallas County, Travis County, Amarillo, and Tarrant County. County. Um, the interesting thing about, about these teams, though, is that there was no set blueprint. Um, it's kind of a blessing and a curse. The Texas Council on Family Violence firmly believes that each, you know, that Texas is so diverse, and it really is, and that all of our communities are so diverse that really what they wanted to do was give um, these communities money to kind of see how they could put a team together. And then they would pull out best practices to be able to share with um, other, um, other jurisdictions, other communities around the state. Um, so what you'll find is through this first round, you had some DVHRTs where the lead agency was a police agency or a law enforcement agency, or you would have one that was based out of the district attorney's office, or you would have one that was based out of the, uh, a DV agency or a provider. So there was, there was really no consistency whatsoever. Uh, again, blessing and a curse because there was no blueprint for us to kind of follow when that second round of funding came through. We were part of the second group, Harris County, Denton, Wilbar, Wilbarger County. We all came bo on board in 2018. We received that funding in, in the, the close of 2017. Um, and then we were off to, to go. I'm sorry, Lindsay, uh, one, one more thing I want to share about that. Um, so it, we, we got it and then it was, all right, you got to get going because like many of our grants, right? You get the money and you say you get the money and then the money doesn't come in for a while and then you can't hire anybody and then you're going back and forth. And so that was basically what happened with this. We had the same situation. We were granted this money, we were awarded this money and then the money came in and we were scrambling to try and get the position filled. And, um, and uh, 
So there was, it was a grant request that was made by the division chief at the time, uh, Carvana Cloud. She was granted this money and I just happened to be somebody that was uh, interviewing at the Family Criminal Law Division. I had been there before. I had worked in that division once before. Um, and I was asked if I would take this project on. So I was actually brought on as an independent contractor. The Harris County District Attorney's Office received the grant, but I was an independent contractor that came on to, to work this grant to get a team up and going. Um, please know that these DVHRTs continue to be established around the state. Um, Harris County, we are in our last year of funding, um, but every year more teams come on. In fact, uh, Fort Bend is about to launch their domestic violence high risk team here um, very shortly. Next slide, Lindsay, thank you. So this was a lofty goal, right? I get hired and I have this tremendous task. They tasked me with an ambitious goal of getting a team off the ground. Um, I'm in February of 2018 and I need a team together by August 2018. So I only had five months. And I think it's really important to note that other communities had at least a year to be able to kind of do this research and get things together. Um, but um, there was some really amazing work that was going on and um, we just built upon some of that work. But what we wanted to do as we went into creating this team, we had some really good information that was provided by the uh, coordinating council. There was a law enforcement, uh, community assessment of law enforcement in 2012. And we had this adult fatality review team that had been monitoring and, and researching past homicides in our area that was really producing some quality information for us. And what we knew about our uh, community is that there almost felt like there were distinct groups of survivors. We had survivors who would only access domestic violence agencies and shelters that never would engage with the criminal justice system. We had some, uh, we had survivors that would come through the criminal justice system, either willingly by them calling the police or somebody else calling the police or them getting a protective order that never wanted to engage with a domestic violence agency or a shelter. We did have some that engaged in the two, but the communication between those two systems was really rough and not consistent. And then we also have a whole group of survivors that don't want to access either either uh, system. Um, they don't want to. They don't trust the police. Um, they don't trust uh, calling for help. They don't trust going to a domestic violence agency. Um, but what we did know, based on the um, the homicides that we had reviewed, is that like uh, Jeannie Geiger, like Heather and Kelly had shared, that there was some type of interaction with law enforcement at some point. Next slide. So what we knew we wanted to do was, of course, break down those silos, right? We had survivors coming to us and we very much get tunnel vision on that. Like, what can we do with our own agency? We wanted to take away those blinders. We wanted to make sure that we were having a bigger conversation with all the systems that were involved. The beauty of what the DVHRT really brings. We wanted to look at those gaps on a micro and macro level. We wanted to see what we could do to, um, you know, to, to make sure that that survivor was safe and what we were doing to try and hold the offender, you know, or somebody that chooses violence more accountable for their actions. We also wanted to look at how we were responding to these cases on a bigger level. Um, where are those gaps and what can we do to close them? Of course, we wanted to make sure that communication was going back and forth um, you know, between all of those agencies. And we wanted to create a pathway for survivors if they choo you know, choose to move forward through the criminal justice system, that we were doing our best to coordinate those protective tools, to get those protective tools that they wanted, um, to offer valuable information every step of the way that would also help with the safety planning um, and all of the, the, the work that was being done um, uh, to provide, again, that, that safety. It's important also to note that one of the things that we wanted this to do was also drive our conversation into really looking at ways that we were offering support of services and rehabilitation to people who choose violence. It's important that we say that because this is not just about the survivor. This is about making sure that we are doing something that will also change behavior so this person doesn't continue to do that again. That was also something that was, was very important as we were moving into this. Next slide. So as I said, in 2018, we get this grant, um, you know, and we got to hit the ground running. Um, and we did. Um, but the, the good thing was, is like I said, there was some amazing work that was being done already. Um, we had the strangulation task force um, that was created. And that was, again, through some of the work that uh, that a past division chief was doing um, and through the, the coordinating council where they had all law enforcement together in a room um, to talk a little bit about um, 
the high lethality around impeding breath cases. We know these are a really dangerous form of, of violence. Uh, we know that there are lasting consequences sometimes for our survivors when they have been strangled. Um, and so it was a, a, a very successful collaboration and coalition of law enforcement, heads of law enforcement coming together to draft a strangulation supplement that is now throughout Harris County um, that is used for every single impeding breath call that comes through. Um, that was a very successful collaboration. We had that buy-in from the top. It was fantastic. And what we were able to do is use some of those partners um, from that to take them to this next place, which was trying to create this team. We also had this really interesting initiative that was happening in the, in, in, uh, the DA's office. Um, the DA's office has a very specialized uh, division that Mary's in, in uh, the head of. It's the Family Criminal Law Division. Um, so they have caseworkers and social workers who uh, reach out to, to individuals um, that have been affected by, by uh, intimate partner violence. But they also had some caseworkers, some dedicated caseworkers and social workers that were getting the impeding breath charges. So if um, any charge that came through, um, it went immediately to them and they were tasked with calling within 24 to 48 hours to try and get that person set up in some type of services. So we had this, this um, initiative happening. And that's originally how we were, those were the cases we were concentrating on. We were concentrating on the impeding breath. We have since shift, shifted because we know there are all different ways that cases could come to us. And so we now, or, or the Family Criminal Law Division now uses Dr. Jacqueline Campbell's uh, danger assessment tool just to do an overall kind of triage. Um, and then we um, also have that kind of what we call the very technical term of the gut check. You know, you, you get very nervous about a case that's coming forward and you wanna do something about that. So cases come from the, the uh, Family Criminal Law Division um, through the danger assessment or through partner agencies. Next slide. So remember, this is how we had to get this team off the ground. So right now in Harris County, there are actually two teams that are operating. We have this bigger team that was from that TCFE grant, right? And that's what I'm focusing on right now. And then we're gonna talk about Pasadena. So this bigger team, Harris County Domestic Violence um, uh, High Risk Team, it meets, month, um, it meets monthly, last Wednesday of every month. We have been meeting since August, 2018. Um, we will continue to meet. There's only two times when we haven't. And one was because we thought a natural disaster was coming our way, a hurricane. And the other time was when COVID hit and we were all kind of scrambling like, okay, what does this mean and how do we work? Um, so our partners for this team include uh, HPD. We have officers from the Family Violent Unit, Violence Unit and the Domestic Response domestic abuse response team. We have some folks from the sheriff's office. We have probation at the table. Of course, we have DA's office. We have aid to victims of domestic abuse. This is a DV agency, but it also pro uh, provides legal assistance for our survivors. So if they're looking to get a divorce or child custody, they can even do a protective order there. They're at the table. We have the coordinating council, which is the, count the, the group I'm affiliated with. We have the Texas uh, Attorney General's Office, Crime Victims Compensation Division. We have the Harris County Fugitive Task Force. We do have a federal attorney who sits with us and we do have some representatives from the Houston Area Women's Center. So currently how this works is we have point people within each of these agencies. We come together, we discuss cases every month, but the more um, the, the best part of it is that we have these point people. So when we call them, we you know tell them about a case that we're concerned about. It's their responsibility to get that information to the appropriate people and to kind of have this case rise to the top so that we can go ahead and uh, make sure it's on everybody's radar. Um, and I will tell you, during COVID, this has been invaluable. This system has really been helping us um, because, um, you know, people have been out, um, you know, um, you know we, we call on each other. Um, the, the beauty of the team that doesn't really get talked about is the trust and the rapport that you have with each other. We have talked numerous times and continue to say, if you have an ego, check it at the door. We don't want to hear it because it's not about you. It's not about your agency. Okay, this is about the survivor and it's about doing something to provide that safety that is needed and the accountability that is needed. So we really do a good job of keeping each other in check and saying, no, don't give me pie in the sky. Give me what can you do right here, right now. And so, um, and our team is really responding to that and it's been really powerful. Next slide. 
So, you know, one of those things when we talk about ego is the fact that it, we, we do not mind turning that mirror on ourselves and we continue to do it time and time again, just to make sure that we are doing this to the best of our ability. Um, you know, it's no good recognizing high risk cases if we can't provide that safety and, and that uh, and the services that are needed. So, but we started to learn things early on in the first year. Um, one of them was the fact that, you know, our team was only triggered when we had cases that were filed. Um, we knew tons of people that this was missing out on tons of people who don't access the criminal justice system. And we were concerned about that. We knew that our team was too large. You know, we had so many cases. And even though we were meeting once a month, the most that we could do was probably eight cases. That's the most that we could review during one setting. Um, so even though we talked to each other in between, we just knew that that was just, just there were just the sheer volume just because of our size, it was too much. We also knew that we were we were not identifying early enough. We were doing a lot of scrambling after that charge came through um, and was filed. You know, we had this tremendous backlog thanks to Hurricane Harvey. And so, you know, if we had talked to a survivor and we knew we needed additional things like a no contact order here, or we needed to advocate for uh, GPS monitoring, we we're having to go back into the crowded court again and try and get it on the radar of the judge. I mean, it was we were just losing precious time in between. And so um, we knew we wanted to try and see if we could identify these cases earlier. And we also wanted to enhance our partnership with our DV uh, um, agencies. You know, I don't know if you know or not, but there are 14 different domestic violence agencies within Harris County, and they're all over, you know, and, and similar to our team, we were getting cases from all over. So it was hard to partner with just one agency um, because you might have somebody that was in Umble. Well, in Umble, the, the closest DV provider is, is family time. So, so we knew we needed to try and figure out a way that we could really make sure we were plugging uh, survivors into a domestic violence uh, agency. Next slide. So, you know, Dr. Maya Angelou gives us these pearls of, of wisdom that continue her legacy. You know, do the best you can until you know better, then when you know better, do better. And again, that's that mirror that we look at our, ourselves all the time. Um, and so um, we wanted to do better. So we decided, you know, we had already been talking to the Jeannie Geiger Crisis Center about, you know, what they had been doing. Again, they are the experts in this and we wanted their help. We knew that we needed to, to um, that we were, we were working, but we maybe were, were, weren't working as efficiently as we could. Um, and we wanted to see if we could, uh, you know, get their guidance and their help. You know, this law enforcement uh, risk assessment tool, we really liked the Dale when we started talking to them more about how they brought the, the I mean, how they came up with the concept and the purpose of the Dale, you know, it really started making us think that this is something that we need to explore. And of course, HPD is so large, Harris County is so large, where do we go? How do we do, what do we, how do we roll this out? So these are the things that we started thinking about. We also wanted to start thinking away from the criminal justice system. You know, we knew our survivors travel many paths for safety. And so we didn't want it to be so completely dependent on the criminal justice system. That's an important tool, no doubt. But how can we shift this a little bit so it's not just the responsibility of the DA's office? And so um, we went ahead and uh, and looked at, at doing that in 20, um, February of this past year. Um, the district attorney's office became a partner and not the lead agency. The coordinating council, you know, accepted me, adopted me, so to speak, and the project and the team. And they also did the investment to make sure that this continued to move forward. One thing to know is that Texas Council on Family Violence was only giving three years of grant assistance. And the assumption was, is that it would get absorbed into other people's budgets. And so tremendously grateful for the council for understanding the importance of this initiative and making um, resources available for this work work to continue on. We also wanted to take a look at that partnership again and really looking at enhancing services with one domestic violence provider. So we approached Jeannie Geiger and, um, and we had many talks and they were very wonderful in saying, yes, we will work with you. We'll see about incorporating the Dale. We will, we, you know, this is going to be great. We'll, we'll use this risk assessment tool. Um, we'll train officers. We'll test this out. It'll help us with better monitoring of these cases. It will help us you know, get immediate safety and services into a DV provider. 
And so that's what we did. We went forward with a mini DVHRT in Pasadena. We approached the Bridge Over Troubled Waters. That's a fantastic DV provider out there. They are amazing. They have a great reputation. They have a fantastic relationship with numerous systems out there, including the police department. And so we knew that this would be, we could get something off the ground fairly quickly. So that's, that's um, in 2019, Jeannie Geiger helped us lay the foundation for the smaller team. We also, we had to talk about the logistics of that. Um, in 2020, we had, um, Jeannie Geiger came down and did a train the trainer for command staff at police, uh, the Pasadena Police Department. And Sergeant Craig Hamilton with Pasadena PD, he was fantastic. He spearheaded this and he trained all the officers immediately, did a fantastic job. And if I can pause for just a second to let you know that Chief Brueger out of Pasadena PD just is amazing. I mean, I didn't have to say too many words to him and he was like, I'll do it. He was like, I, I'll do it, whatever you need. He was like, survivors, it's important that we do this for survivors of domestic violence. I'm there, you know, it's like, and so it's that type of investment and that type of commitment that really makes this powerful. Um, and um, so the project launched in February of 2020. Um, you know, all of Pasadena PD is now, um, Pasadena PD now has the distinction of being the very first law enforcement agency in Harris County to use a risk assessment tool on site for intimate partner violence calls. And it's been really wonderful. We now meet monthly to discuss these cases that screen in as high risk, regardless if charges are pending or not, right? We talk about some of the services that we need to provide. We get them plugged in immediately to the uh, DV provider. Um, so our team consists of the Bridge of Troubled Waters, Pasadena Police Department, the DA's office, and of course, the council. If we need to tag other agencies like probation or parole or you know someone else, because we already have the other team established and we have those point people, I can now reach out to them and say, hey, I got a Pasadena case I'm concerned about. Can you help me with it? And then that rises to the top for them. Next slide. These are just some quotes from uh, uh, Chief Brueger, you know, talking about how uh, happy he is about the uh, collaboration. He feels it's been an effective uh, tool for his officers to affect positive change. Um, I think the next slide is uh, Sergeant Hamilton talking about the value of the Dale. He believes that it really helps, you know, one of the things that they were talking about is how their officers now are advocates almost that because of this screening mechanism, they know that this person is in more danger. And so they're, they're more um, uh, sympathetic. They, they, you know, they have now a validated tool that they're like, no, you have to understand you're in a really bad situation here. Um, and so that's been, that's been helpful. But I think the most important piece, and this is what always hits home for us, is just from the survivors themselves, you know, um, you know, and these are just some of the quotes that we have heard from some of our clients. Um, you know, where have you guys been this whole time? You know, it's like, I'm so glad I found you. Um, you know, how can I find one of you and the team here? This was an interesting situation where we had a really dangerous case, lots of gang activity, lots of concerns about gang retaliation. Um, this was a, a very well-known gang. And so we literally had to move her out of state because we just could not keep her safe here. And so when we moved her to another state, she was asking, well, where's the team here? Why, why can't I have a team like you guys here? So um, uh, really powerful um, to, 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 to hear that just because um, she felt very um, comforted by all of us working together on her behalf. So just a couple other things, you know, um, thank you for being the foundation for my healing. Um, so our survivors um, have been giving us uh, great feedback and letting us know that um, they feel they feel comfortable entering into this being protected by this team. Next slide. So what are the next steps, right? So we've talked to you a little bit about what we're doing. We've talked to you a little bit about what we're doing in Pasadena. We'll continue to monitor. Of course, we have these, uh, this research now that we're providing Jeannie Geiger that we will have you know, at the close of a year being in Pasadena that we can obviously share. But one of the things that we're starting to do is get the word out more to other agencies to let them know about this project and what we're doing. Because as you can see, it can't just be tunnel vision. We can't just be be doing it, you know, the DA's office or this agency. I mean, it has to be a language that we're all 
kind of speaking and um, in order for it to be the most effective. And that is through thinking of ways that we can possibly use the Dale as it travels through the criminal justice system to help guide, not to tell, but just to help guide decisions. Um, you know, so that would include pretrial, that would include judges, you know, that would include, you know, uh, the trial bureau at the DA's office, um, you know, not just specialized divisions, talking to everyone. We're going to continue to evaluate and assess what we're doing here um, and get the, the guidance and the uh, technical assistance from Jeannie Geiger so that we can look to make the team, refine the team, um, you know, revise the team however we need to so that we can continue to do better. Um, we're going to look to try and figure out ways that we can bridge these two teams that are actively working right now. And then our bigger hope is the fact that we can expand this model throughout Harris County. So that is um, the conclusion of everything. That's a lot of information. So I want to kind of stop and just get you know feedback from you guys. Um, wh what are you thinking? Any questions, comments, suggestions? Alicia, I have a quick, number one, I just want to say thank you so much for this presentation from all you guys. It was really informative and really good to know. Um, Question for you guys, we just started our JAD newsletter, and I think this would be wonderful to showcase both this presentation and I see a couple different angles that we could potentially cover in our next December newsletter. So wanted to know if you guys would be comfortable with us being able to share this presentation, um, at least the PowerPoint presentation, and then Alicia and Veronica, I'll be following up with you on some ideas that I have for write-ups to go into the newsletter to make people aware of the project that you guys are doing, what we're all doing as partners, um, if that's cool with everyone. That would be fantastic. Would really appreciate that. And Lindsay, I believe, um, I apologize, we should have probably told you beforehand, but we are recording this training. So um, so that could be available. You know, oh, if great. Well, I will touch base with you to, to give you more details and some stuff that I may need. Fantastic. So thank, thank you guys. Yeah, Laura, that was a great idea. Um, yeah, I just want to say this. I think the concept is fantastic. I'm glad you're doing it. And as I shared with you all the other day, um, I'm going to be assuming a new role next week. So um, we will do what we can to get this integrated. So um, yeah, look forward to working with you on it. I'm going to have to sign off because I've got to run over to the Criminal Justice Center. So really appreciate it. Very insightful, and and if you don't mind, if you if you'd send me the the PowerPoint um, as well, that'd be great. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Y'all have a great day. Bye. Thank you. you know, I think the the other thing that we really need partnership with Jab for is I I know um, Kelly, you you've talked about the OVW grant um, becoming available and that this is a really great opportunity for us as a community to move forward with applying for. And I think we really need the support of the, the Justice Administration Department to, to help us collectively apply as, as a total Harris County community. Good point, thank you, Barbie. Yeah. So OVW has prioritized funding high-risk teams for the last couple of grant cycles across the U.S. Um, and since you all have had laid such a strong foundation, I think you're in a really good position for your next OVW, next OVW grant cycle. So typically that opens up soon with a due date around February. Um, and when we get the solicitation, you all can monitor it as well. But in case you miss it, we'll, you know, we'll make sure we send it your way. Thanks, Kelly. Anything else? Any other questions or comments? Well, I just can't thank you enough. I mean, an hour and a half is a good chunk of your day. And so I, I appreciate, I'm like so grateful, you know, um, to be able to hear this um, and uh, the time that you've given us. So I think this is, um, you know, I, I know I'm a little biased, but um, yeah, but I think it's a great model and I think it would really benefit our community. So I'm grateful uh, to have you all um, listen to it. And I look forward to future conversations so we can continue to do what we can to make 
Harris County um, better for victims of domestic violence. Okay. And, and on behalf of our team too, I just wanna thank you for inviting us into the community and um, just wanna say Texas is in our thoughts with the pandemic and the rising numbers you all are seeing and the struggles and how difficult the work is in this moment. So uh, we have a soft spot for Harris County now. We feel like you're part of our family. So we are um, thinking about you all. And Barbie, we'll follow up with you in a couple of weeks to talk about the grant. Sounds great. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you thank all you so everyone. much. Thanks for having us. Amazing as always. All right, I appreciate your help. Have a great weekend. Bye everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye.